Well, first of all, thanks everyone for uh, coming here. The ninth annual Wisconsin Muskie Expo. Any first timers here? Good. We welcome it. Right now we've got uh, four seasoned guides up here that tackle a little subject that is controversial in some circles. And I mentioned circle because those of us, I started fishing muskies when I was 14 years old. Started guiding then, I'm now 66. I've got a few in the boat. Started with circle hooks, let them chew on suckers for a month, pull them in. You've all been there for fishing muskies for a long time. But obviously things have changed. Catch and release, a huge, huge thing right now. Very good for the resource, very good for the tax service, which is good. But uh, we've got four guys here to talk about that. They've got some really good information for you, and it's a, a good panel discussion. They'll be taking a lot of questions, too, so we'll turn it over to these guys. They'll introduce themselves. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Partika. I'm from Town of Muskies, Inc. in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I just want to welcome everybody here today, as well as our panelists. We'll go through the introductions uh, in a little bit. But um, before we get started, does anybody know what these are? Has anybody seen these before? We know anybody own one, a pair of these? Nipex? Okay, great. We'll get to that later. I just want to get a feel for uh, what we've got in the audience. So, we've gathered the folks here today um, based on some in, uh, an incident that happened last year during the opener on, on May 26th of last year. Uh, Buddy and I were fishing on uh, in the Green Bay system, and we came across a dead floater, basically. So we've got pit tag readers in our boats. We wanted to see if we can uh, get some data for it for the uh, DNR to get some uh, history on that fish and also um, submit that to the DNR for their research. Uh, unfortunately, when we, when I tried pulling it out of the water, I looked down at its gullet and you can see there I found a bucktail snipped off above the skirt um, with a nipex, obviously a nipex. Um, we've had the uh, DNR stopped by while we were on this fish, or a little bit later, I'm sorry, um, and they both saw it and confirmed that this was pr pretty much 100% avoidable if the angler would have had some long nose pliers, because I was able to get this bait out, no, no problem. I still own that bait, it's at my house. But um, that was a sad incident. So I had posted something on social media, and Rich Reiner was kind enough to chime in and said, basically, I just PM'd you, give me a call. So what I did is I, I reached out to him and he said, you know, what are you guys doing as far as um, trying to promote ca safe catch and release? And this is something that I've had on my mind for the past three years, since 2017. Uh, we see a lot of dead floaters in Green Bay, unfortunately, perhaps more than anybody else, just because you've got some really big fish and everybody wants to come up and, and have their shot at a super tanker, and we love that. We want people to fish for our fish, uh, for our muskies, but we want to make sure that they're also using the proper methods, uh, tools, and uh, tactics out on the water. I want to thank Rich Reiner for reaching out to us, as well as the Muskie Expo Pro staff. Um, Ross's Sports Shop, I want to give them a big shout out. Uh, they actually went out and purchased a lot of release tools specifically for this event. Um, so we thank them and we want to direct everybody to go to them specifically. Uh, they've got a great selection of the top of the line stuff out there. So, And then also Laxby Productions, we want to give them a huge shout out. Hey Bob. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming and doing this. This is a much needed seminar for a lot of people. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity. This is a critical uh, educational uh, opportunity for all of us right now. So, just want to let everybody know that we do have a booth here, our Title Town group. Um, it's actually great for kids as well. We've got a number of different stations. We've got education stations basically. We show people how to use tools. We've got a wide variety of catch and release tools. Some good, some bad, just to show you, hey, what works and what doesn't. We've also got a video running. It's a 40-something minute video with nearly 100 fish on there, catch and release, so you can take a look at that and see um, how we do it, a lot of the folks in our club. We've also got uh, a section where people can actually use a side cutter versus a nipex on, say, a five-aught hook and see the difference and why we really need to be using the right tools out there on the water. And then finally, we've got our kids sucker fishing, so we definitely want kids to stop by. We've got a small, Ice fishing rod with a magnet on the end, and we've got binder clips at the end of lollipops so the kids can do that. It's been a huge hit for the weekend. And then we actually show kids the proper way to hold the fish as well and get some pictures of them and really get them excited about the potential of the well and catch a muscle for themselves and do it the right way. So we encourage everybody to please stop by our booth and bring the kids. That leads us to our panelists today. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the folks to uh, introduce themselves, but just to give you a hint of what we wanted to accomplish here, 
because there's so many different varieties of types of conditions, you know, so we figured we could get what we consider to be experts in multiple disciplines. First off, we've got uh, Phil Schweik to talk about his expertise in rivers. We've got Kevin Pischke, who's a, a guide out on Green Bay to talk about Great Lakes, big water. Then we've got Jeff Van Memorial to speak about inland systems. And then finally, we've got Jordan Winks, who's not only a muskie biologist, um, but also an avid angler for many, many years. So he's a really good stick. So he can give us some additional perspective from a biological standpoint. So we're really excited to have all these guys here. Um, please give a quick round of applause, and then we will uh, get the introduction started. Hi guys, I'm Phil Schweik. I'm a local fishing guide. I uh, spent a lot of my time on the Wisconsin River, Lake Bay, but I'm also a musky tournament angler. And I travel all over the state tournament fishing. I've been fishing muskies probably close to 50 years, and I've seen a lot of changes on this river system. Some good, some bad. And uh, don't be afraid to ask a bunch of questions later. And we're gonna get into detail a lot about some of the things that I see, especially with current and conditions on the river, that take place that a lot of people don't understand and uh, may someday save your life, may save a fish's life, but we're going to get into that later. Thank you for coming. Uh, Kevin Pischke, born and raised in Green Bay, been fishing that body of water since I was uh, five years old and been guiding out there the last 10, exclusively musky fishing about the last 20 years because uh, an old wise mentor told, told me if you want to be good at it, you better stick with it and don't try and be good at everything because you never will be. Uh, my big thing is safety on the water for yourself and for the fish. Uh, I do have a full-time job as a firefighter, so I'm one of the guys that has to go out there in case things go wrong. And on the bay, any of the Great Lakes, with the way the weather changes, things can get ugly. So number one, safety for you. And number two, we're going to talk about safety for the fish, especially on big water, how to revive them, how to hold them in the water, uh, you know, how it is to do it you know, safely for you and the fish. Uh, my name is Jeff Henry Bartle. I'm based in northern Wisconsin. I own WDH Guide Service. Um, Kevin and I actually got our captain's licenses together. It's the first time I met Kevin. And um, so I've been guiding about the same time. I started in 2009. I've been guiding full time uh, since 2012. Um, and since 2012 to, pre to present, I've handled 1,056 muskies in northern Wisconsin waters. We've had a couple die, but most of them have gone off. And, and I'd like to take, uh, take this opportunity to share some of those small tricks that, that help save some of the fish where almost weekly basis, we'll catch one in our boat. I'm sure these guys, same deal, where you look at it and you go, you're really lucky you bit this bait and not in like maybe the average person's boat because they might not have been able to, you know, get that fish unhooked safely and released, so. Hi, my name's Jordan Weeks. I work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I've been a permanent employee there for 16, 16 years. Uh, my voice is loud enough, I probably don't need this, but uh, I also have been writing for Muskie Hunter Magazine in the as a research editor since 2006. And what I do in there essentially is to take scientific literature and give you the clip notes version as the anglers so that you can digest what we're finding out in the scientific community. Hopefully use that information to catch more muskies, but more importantly to kind of sometimes dispel some myths that are out there. Uh, this thing is a little wonky, but uh, dispel some myths that are out there change how you operate as an angler. Thank you very much guys. Honored to have you guys here with us today. Uh, I'm going to go over the topics real quickly here. Uh, just a quick overview of everything we hope to cover. We've only got an hour here so it's very unlikely we'll hit on every single one in depth but I just wanted to give you kind of a view for uh, the type of things that I've been working with these guys, I reached out to them back in September already and gave them basically a list of the types of stuff that we wanted to cover in this. And not necessarily how to catch fish, but what to do once you get one on, uh, on your line and then make sure that it's really safe. So first and foremost, we're going to be talking about preparation for the hunt before you even take a step on the water. Uh, we'll be talking about tools of the trade, uh, net essentials, what you look for in nets, from hook set to battle, what transpires there, and then also and during that fight, we want to get some uh, feedback from Jordan on what happens from a musky, from a physiology standpoint. But we'll talk about that. We'll also be talking about mechanics of proper netting. Uh, what do you do when you're solo versus uh, versus working as a team? One thing that's really critical there as as team is that you need to make sure that you're communicating throughout the entire process. Don't assume your buddy knows what he what you want. Uh, so the communication part is something we'll be talking about. Next up, we've got once you get the fish in the bag, 
Obviously, you want to try your best to get that in the bag head first, but sometimes you get fish that are gator roll on you. You may high bag them sometimes, and their head may be out of the water while the net's hanging over the gunnel. Uh, what do you do in those issues? And then also, why we use the nets that we do uh, as a holding pen, basically to do these, uh, <coughs> the release uh, protocol that we, we all follow on the water. Uh, then we're going to talk about hooks. When you cut them, when you not cut them. Uh, we'll also be talking about bogas. Hopefully everybody's seen one of these before. Um, we'll have some discussion on its use. There's been a lot of controversy on that over the several, past several years, but uh, we want to get some experts advice on that. Also, we'll be talking about picture perfect, how to handle the fish to make sure you get your, your good shots. Uh, revival and release, live well tactics, as well as we'll be talking about busy logic. We'll talk specifically about what that is uh, a little later on. And then we'll talk about some high-level items like casting versus trolling. And then we'll get into the items such as current. Phil deals with current that a lot of the other guys probably never see, um, you know, working rivers like he does. Um, so he's, he's got some excellent information he's going to share with us on how to handle that. Kevin, work, you know, has been handling a lot, working a lot of big water for a lot of years. I know Jeff's got some experience out there as well, so you know, we want to get some some feedback from them. And then as well as, you know, the inland lakes, they've got some issues that they deal with that are typically a little, um, something you don't see too much on the uh, on the Great Lakes side or the river systems is, is water temps and oxygen levels, things like that. So we'll be talking about that hopefully. And then we'll close it up with some common mistakes that they see, how to avoid those. Um, when things go wrong, how do you recover in the boat? How do you think on your toes and make sure that you're doing the best that you can to make sure that, that fish is released safely? And then, um, in today's day and age, it wouldn't be uh, a valid discussion unless we talk about some social media issues. So, um, uh, it might be a little controversial. We'll see. We're going to try to be as uh, diplomatic about it as possible, but it's, it's an important topic. Oh, Jordan won't. But, uh, <laughs> but it's an important topic that we need to discuss. So, that said, um, we will get right into this here. But I just want to show, first off, here's some of the tools that um, basically I use in my boat. I've got a, a tool bag, I've got basically multiples of everything. In case something goes over the water or over the side of the boat, I've got backup for everything. Um, and then on the right hand side, just some basics that every angler should have before they even hit the water. You know, you've got your longbow pliers, you've got hook out tool, um, your nipex gloves if you need, if you prefer to use those. So what I want to start with is preparation for the hunt. I will hand it over to Phil to talk about what he does before he even hits, hits the water. On to one microphone, huh? I think we are. Huh? That's all right. Um, preparation for the hunt. Some of the things that I think about before I go musky fishing, like he was mentioning, having those proper tools in your boat, especially your release tools. But also make sure your net's good shape. Um, the uh, just a quick story. I remember being in a fishing tournament with a friend of mine. Yeah, he was actually fishing. Fishing in a different boat, and uh, they had caught a nice musky, registered it, and. Um, got a second fish and had it in that 45 inch tiger muskie. The partner was holding the net and the judge came over, they filled out the paperwork, lifted up the net, muskie was gone. Over the winter, um, Mouse had chewed a hole through the net just big enough for that muskie to shoot out and uh, those two gentlemen no longer fished together. It cost <laughs> them about $10,000. But in addition to that, um, there's a lot of things, and I'm sure the rest of these guys are going to talk about boat safety and stuff like that, especially if you're out on the big water. But one of the most important things that I think about, too, is making sure your batteries are charged, especially fishing in current a lot of times below dams, and I'll get into that stuff a little bit later. But I've been involved in a lot of incidences on the water where people have been in dire straits. I've actually rescued people on the water that were trapped up against the dam, and I've been on the water with the DNR and the sheriff and family members looking for bodies for people that had drowned because they don't know and understand the current in the river. And we'll get into that later, but um, I'll hand this over to Kevin and let him carry on from there. All right, preparation for me, uh, if anybody's, I know there's people here that have been in my boat, is everything in my boat is organized. Nothing's laying around, nothing's out of the place. I don't want hooks out. I don't want something that people can get hurt on or myself. So number one, boat is always squared away. Everything always goes back in the same spot. I know where, if I got a fish in the net, I know right where to reach for my players, for my cutters. It's the muscle memory thing. I don't have to think. 
because when we think, we make mistakes. So organization, number one, Cabo, and number two, Big Water, I want to know my options. I want to know where we're launching from, what the weather is going to be, stay updated on the weather, and also know my other landings. If you make a 15-mile run to the west shore, the wind picks up opposite direction, and now you're dealing with four or five-foot waves, where's the safe harbor? So a lot of that, you know, like I said, you know, not really getting into like what I should have in the boat, lure wise, but you know, like I said, it's organized, everything's in its place. I have a backup plan if the weather goes bad, if things happen, and then the same thing with the safety gear out in that big water. Uh, and also, when people are in my boat, we do the little drill. Here's where you find this, here's where you find that. If this happens, if that happens, just have it all laid out because when things go wrong, it's, it's obviously it's too late. Um, I'm, I fall very much into the category with Kevin there on the organization. It's, it's funny you hear every different every different musky fisherman between guides and you work a day. There's, everybody's got a different, uh, shall we say, organization level in the boat. Mine is pretty high. I, I, you don't want baits laying around. You want that stuff below deck and out of the way as much as possible for a number of reasons. One, for your personal safety, like Kevin says, so you'll step on a hook or have something like that. But two, when you're fighting a fish and then you have to handle the fish afterwards, that's not the time to be getting stuff out of the way. You want a nice open deck. It makes it easier for fighting fish. It makes it easier for landing fish and also for the photograph and release portion of that. Um, aside from you know the tools, I keep multiples of everything, as Bob had mentioned. I usually keep a pair of pliers and uh, hook cutters either in my one very obvious compartment of my boat, which I can easily point to anybody that's in my boat and say, grab it, it's right there, or I have them sitting right at my dash, and then I always have another pair in my, in my backpack or my lunchbox or whatever I have with me for the day. So I've always got something handy in case it does slip out of your hands, because uh, that does happen, especially in big water where a pliers get go a wall on you so you always want to have extras of that stuff i'm going to go at this a little bit different what i'm going to talk about is if if you're in a situation where you have a fish that dies on you i'm going to jump right to that quickly because this i think it fits in with the how to be prepared most of us know where we're going to go fishing for the day and if you take just a few minutes you can identify who within the department of natural resources you could call to have them help you with this fish um, very few muskies get harvested, and we only get our best scientific information from fish that are deceased. So we don't kill them on purpose to find that information, but we could use a fish that unfortunately would die on some angler to gain really important scientific information. So what I'm trying to say is find out who to call, whether it's the game warden tip line or the local biologist. Have that number in your phone. Give them a call and say, what do I do with this fish? I just had one die. So that's on any size of the fish. We can work out how to get that fish taken care of so we can get good scientific information from those fish. So I know it's a little morbid, but it does happen. All right, excellent. If we can now talk about uh, the tools that you guys use. Uh, we, we talked about that a little bit high level, but is there anything specific, uh, Phil, that you use from a, from a river perspective that maybe an inland lakes or a big lakes guy might, might not use in his boat? I see the... Is this working? Yeah. I'd say the biggest thing I use in my boat as far as tools that I trade is a spot lock on my trolling motor. 99% of the time, especially in current, the guy gets a fish on spot lock. The boat's going to hold you right there. We get a fish in the net. We got time to take care of it. We're not drifting around, especially with the current. Unlike where if you're on a lake and it's not windy, you're just sitting still. On a river, your boat is constantly moving. You've got to be prepared for where it's headed. So a guy gets a fish in the boat, it's like a, it's like a Chinese fire drill. And, and I'm sure all of you know that especially if it's your first muskie. The last thing you're thinking about is which direction is that boat going? And a lot of times you could be heading towards rocks, towards trees, downriver, and uh, spot locks, very, very important on your boat. So I'm gonna take it right from there, uh, especially with the trolling aspect on big water is your autopilot on your trolling motor. I see way too often guys are running around, I should say running around, they're trolling, and they've got a remote control, whether it's a, uh, you know, the, the motor guide or one of the, uh, Minn Kota's, get your trolling motor in the water. You're not gonna wreck it, it's not gonna rip out. When that fish gets on, you can use your trolling motor, you can cut your kicker down. Number one, you're slowing down, so it's a more fair fight, and it's better for the fish. But number two, you can use your autopilot to stay going in a direction. I see too many times guys get a fish, they throw the boat in neutral, there's a 15 mile an hour wind. Now the boat has done three circles, they got five other lines tangled up, and the fish is also tangled up in that mess. So now you're jeopardizing the safety of that fish, could break the line, get away with the lure and small pore, it's obviously tangled up, floating sideways. So what Phil said about using the spot lock, when you're trolling big water, use that autopilot on that trolling motor to keep that safe. 
Ditto. <laughs> okay, Joey's yeah, good in the interest of time, in the interest of time, absolutely what they said. Spot lock, make sure you got a, a good position and handle on your orientation. One for the fish, also it does keep you positioned, you know, in a current situation, in a wind situation, it keeps that fish on one side, so the bag of the net is underneath the boat, it's not. You're in one contained position and the fish is easier to work on. Excellent. I want to talk about nets now. I want to get panelists opinion on this. Would you consider this a really good musky net, say for a Green Bay? Or even up north? Nowhere. Nowhere? Nowhere. What about something like something like this? A little better? Okay. Nice deep hoop in there, or deep bag, big hoop. But they do make bigger ones out there. So what are your thoughts on nets? What do you guys look for when uh, you're hitting the water and choosing the net that you use? Um, yeah, to, to his point, I think uh, that's a very good option there. The, any of the newer nets that you've seen out there, I, I run a fairly taller catch still. I actually like the lighter bag than that one, um, simply because it's more maneuverable for the people that are fishing by themselves. You're going to have a lot less high bagged fish. Um, the big Kahuna bag on there, it's coated, it's nice, it doesn't split as many fins, but it is a bear to work with and it's extremely heavy. And it will cost you fish, um, you know, because you won't be as quick as you could be, not as tactical as you could be with a lighter net. Um, that being said, uh, anything wide and deep. Um, if you're in a pinch and you need to do it with a smaller net, if you're, you know, say, out of season incidental catch, you do what you have to do, but certainly you want to go out there prepared with the appropriate tools. Uh, definitely, I, my gauge with guys I always ask, I'm like, step in the bag, and the hoop should come when you pull it up between your waist and your, somewhere between your waist and your armpit. So you want a bag that's four foot deep. Uh, I run a big kahuna when we're trolling, or if I'm casting and I know who's in my boat, if I'm out by myself with my family, uh, new anglers, I use the conservation series from uh, Frabo. It's a little lighter, it's the one with the gold handle that Booker always pushed, but it's maneuverable for one person or for a smaller person or somebody that's new to fishing. The bait is not the strongest, but it's still coated. It's pretty safe for the fish, but again, it's something you can handle by yourself or with one arm because that big kahuna is a little heavy one arm net by yourself. It's good if you're in a team. If you're fishing with somebody else, big kahuna is an excellent option. Oh yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with it, it's just yeah. that something to consider. Yeah. Well I gotta agree with both these guys on using a big net. I personally use the big kahuna in the boat. That's all I use. Um, I like the sturdy freeable handle that's on there. But one of the big important things that these guys didn't talk about is once the fish is in the net, what I do with that, especially if there's two or three people in the boat, is I'll get the get the net up alongside the edge of the boat, and a lot of guys will let that hang over the edge. Well, a lot of times that fish can start to jump, and then he'll get the hooks hung up on the edge, and then he's hanging there. So what I tell people when they're in the boat is we get the fish in the net, and then you pull the net back until the lip of the outside of the net, the rim, is on the inside of the boat. So you pull it back like this. So this. This part of the net is on the inside of the boat. That way that fish can't jump. And he can't jump out of the net, he can't get away. It gives you time to get everything organized. Because like I said before, it's a three ring circus when you get a muskie in the boat and there goes something off the front of this. But at least that fish isn't gonna get away and you're gonna have time to take care of them properly. So um, I'm gonna go at this from the scientific aspect. <laughs> so I actually am just, there's a, next month's Muskie Hunter is going to have this article in it, and it was a research project done on bluegill. Now I know bluegill aren't muskies, but if net type has mortality effects on bluegill, you better believe it's going to have mortality effects on muskies. So it, the part about this that hits home a little bit to me here is I actually use one of the nets that has one of the higher mortality rates. Uh, Kevin just mentioned one as well. My favorite is that conservation series net because of its ease of use and ease to get the, the hook out. However, to make this whole article kind of a Cliff Notes version, a rubberized bag is the best. Knotless mesh. So the kahuna that he has is a knotless mesh. That other net has knots. Knots can give severe skin abrasion, remove slime and scales, and cause infection in fish. So it increases mortality. Um, so you want a net with a rubberized bag, smallest holes possible as far as the just the mortality of the net effect, and also knotted or knotless mesh. You should never use one of those uh, string nets with knots in it, ever. 
because um, if you do, you might as well just take the fish home. Um, and when I talk about mortality, these aren't insignificant numbers. If we assume that general hooking mortality is in the neighborhood of 5%, this can double that and sometimes more than double that mortality. So the, the coarse knotted mesh had almost a 14% mortality rate on bluegills. And that is significant. Even if we're in the ballpark for muskies, it's a big deal. So knotless, small mesh. Sure. Building on his point, it's something that I've noticed in my boat, and it's something that I, I kind of use as an educational tool when I'm when I'm unhooking and handling fish. Using the smallest holes possible is a really good a good a good. Uh, I mean, it's a good general guideline. But the other thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is the eyes of the fish. You have to realize that if that fish is hit, if it goes through where you've got a hole, it's raking across that fish's eyes. They don't have eyelids. They have nothing to protect them there. Anything abrasive going straight across their corneas can't be good for them. All right? I have not done a study on that, backed it up in any way, shape, or form, but I think we can all agree that common sense would dictate that that's probably a bad thing for them. So handling in the net, always consider the eyes of the fish um, whenever you've got them in the net and even when you're pulling them up, up against that bag. Try to clear that mesh from around those eyes um, as you start working or before you start working on that fish as one of the first and foremost in addition to where the hook is placed. Excellent point. Thank you, Jeff. I um, want to continue on this scientific uh, course here. Uh, talking about musky physiology, Jordan, during the actual fight, during the battle, um, do you have any insight you may be able to share with us that uh, most folks wouldn't necessarily be attuned to? Sure. There, ha there has been some research done on like actual body chemistry levels of muskies, but that's kind of heavy topic. And so, and so the way I'd like to sum this up for you is um, using the word stress, right? So the, we've all decided to fish muskies, so we've all taken it upon ourselves to, to say, okay, we're willing to stress these fish to a certain extent for our enjoyment, and that's fine. We're all doing it, right? But the minute that fish is hooked, it's out of its normal routine, which starts, initiates stress. And every second that that fish is being fought, netted, held, photographed, and even when you put it back in the water and you hold on to the fish's caught up and uncle, the tail, that's continuing that stress level. So stress kills fish faster than any other item out there. I'll give you an example from our hatchery system. If our hatchery folks get to the hatchery and the fish aren't eating, they freak out because there's just a matter of a small window of time before everything's dead. Because the first thing a fish will do when it's stressed is stop feeding. And so that's an indicator that you have to do something fast. So it's, it's an example of how we need to understand that stress is a factor to these things. Try to minimize and get as fast as you can with the hook removal, the picture, the glory part of it, and then get that fish back into its environment. And I would say when you do that, try to put it in the water and don't hold it. If it's upright, leave it be. These, these glamour shots where we're doing it, I know they look super cool where the fish is along the boat and we hold them for 20 minutes and put them back and forth and wiggle them like this to try to get them to go. They can feel your hand on there. Their body is a giant um, sensory organ. So they know they're being held and is continuing that stress level. I can't say enough that put them in the water, let them do their thing. They're going to recover quickest that way by just letting them be in their normal environment. And that's, this is like a seminar topic in itself, so I'm trying to make exactly. it short. I 100% agree, Jordan nailed that. I, I, when you're releasing those fish, the huge pet peeves of mine, we've got the two-handed hold. Where they got them around the belly and they're moving it back and forth. Wipe it as much slime off as possible. No, no, no. Get it in the water, support it so that it's upright. If the fish is upright, as always, Jordan said, best to do. When I'm holding them in the back, I'm very rarely gripping it, handling it all over the place. I'll use my in waves and stuff where you need a little bit more grip. Okay, you do what you have to do to make sure that the fish does not become not upright, but just a, a finger and a thumb on the edge of the tail, touching the fish as little as possible, just enough to keep that fish, you know, from wobbling side to side. And if they're wobbling side to side, that could be a, a bad sign already. But in general, minimal touching, minimal handling, and try your very best to not wipe and hold them all over the body. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, what we'd like to do now is talk about some netting tactics. Uh, we hit on nets a little bit, but let's talk some specifics that you guys use in the boat to make sure that you're um, using the best processes and tactics out of the water. Well, kind of back to what Jeff and Kevin said earlier in the, in the seminar, organization is number one. Um, I'm sure all of you know that uh, 
you get a musky on in your boat, you go to grab your net, it's going to be hooked on something. It's going to be hooked on a cleat, it's going to be hooked on a windshield, it's going to be hooked on a rod, there's going to be a reel caught in there. We've all been there. Number one thing I make sure of in my boat is that net is clear. So when somebody gets a fish on, I grab the net and it's not hooked up on anything. I've seen it too many times. I've had tournament partners that they're grabbing a net, it's hooked around their cleat, they're yanking and yanking, they can't get it free. So number one thing is make sure that net is clear and free. Second of all, I want that fish in the net as soon as possible, immediately. I've had guys that are loosening up the drag. I want to play with it. No, you don't. I want that fish in the net right now. You're stressing them out. Now, something that a lot of people don't think about is then the next step is when you're in current, and you've got a fish in the net, they start to twist and they, they want to swim back upriver. They always want to swim back upriver in the net and the current's pulling them down so they're in there like a, like a U and that can be very dangerous for them. So you want to make sure you've got a big net like that big kahuna so you got some room to maneuver in that net. Now something I'm going to touch on real quick after that is now the release of that fish after you've got them in the net. Every time you take a fish out of the net and you're in current, you put that fish in the water, he's gonna wanna turn and go down river. And that's not good. As opposed to kind of what Jeff was saying is hold them under the belly, you almost have to hold them that way and you wanna face them into the current. Because if you're holding them and they're turning and they're down river, the gills are gonna flare open and they're gonna drown. You may think it's great to pull them back and forth, that's the worst thing you can do for them. You've actually gotta hold them with two hands, face them into the current so they can survive. Because you gotta get them back into their normal normal way of life, because most of the time when they're in the river, they're facing into the current. One of the biggest things, to touch on a trolling aspect of it, is when you go to net that fish, so many people put the net over the boat with the whole bag, and now the bag of that big kahuna, or whatever style net you're using, is three feet beyond the hoop of the net. So when the person goes to pull the fish up, you end up hooking the lure on the outside of the net, and now you've got huge issues. So when you dip it over, and even casting, Fish. I always hook my other finger the closest to the hoop on the net bag and as it goes over the side of the boat and just as the fish is going into the net, let that bag drop. Because I've had twice where things happen and you didn't do it in time and that net is now bulk behind the boat and you end up snagging the fish on that. Uh, that's another thing where it comes into play with, you know, slow the boat down when you're trolling, use that trolling motor, have your kicker in neutral or at idle because uh, it's a lot easier to net that fish and it's a lot less stress on that fish fighting it at, you know, three quarters of a mile an hour versus three. And then same thing, you know, now that fish is in the net and the boat's still moving forward because you have lines in the water and that fish is getting twisted behind the boat because there's that dead area of water between your motor and your transom and now there's current. So slow that boat down as much as you can and you know, get that fish so it's not getting dragged backwards because essentially when you're pulling that fish backwards, you're drowning it because the water's going the wrong way through the gills. And then quickly on the organization, my net's always in the exact same spot for trolling and another exact same spot for casting. And you show people, just lift it up or lift it up to save that, getting hooked on a cleat, getting hooked on a tackle box. So again, you know, when you think, you make mistakes. So that's why I eliminate thinking. Yeah, that's the, in the interest of time, I'll keep it brief, but I would add one thing to that in terms of when you do make that mistake, when that does happen, aside from when you're trolling and then you miss your shot on that net and the net bag now has drifted out this way and you're hooked on that, that's a completely different scenario than you would deal with in a normal casting situation. But when you go to cast, when you're casting and bringing in a fish and you're not under power and you go to net that fish and you do make a bad shot on that, you do get a head, you know, like head, get, they try to get away at the last second, you get them caught on the edge of the bag, you high bag them in that or get them on the outside, or you got a pancake them back in. When that does happen, once the fish is in the bag, don't feel the need to then immediately lift up the bag and keep them up high for them to not get away. I mean, I've had a lot of people on my boat kind of freak out when I go to net a fish and, you know, it goes the wrong way or things when you should zag, but it gets in the bag, but if now the hooks are buried in the bag, the hooks are still in the fish's face, it's not going anywhere. I don't mind leaving that net still down in a way that would, to the average person, think like, oh, that thing could get away. It's not going anywhere. You're better off for the sake of that fish, especially on much smaller fish, to just let that go limp, for lack of a better word, and not have so much resistance yanking on that fish, because now you're not using a rod to play it. You're using an actual rigid metal arm and a stiff bag of a net. You can do a lot more damage to that fish when it tries to thrash you. Excellent points. Um, one, one quick action. You, you talked about high bagging a couple of guys did. Yep. That could be a problem with those knotless small mesh nets. If you really care about the fish and you have that happen, have somebody take the whole net and the fish and put it under the water. You run the risk of losing the fish, 
but it's better for the fish as long as it's underwater and get your, all your tools together, get your plan made while that fish is under the water. So it's not out of the water while it's high back at the top of that by the rim of the net. Just stick it vertical right in the water. And that fish can breathe while you can gather yourself and come up with a plan to remove those hooks as quick as possible. Whether it's cut them out of the net, um, that's usually the best technique. Cut the hooks that are caught in the net so that the fish can get in the bottom of the bag. Excellent point. And regarding that, um, that takes us into our next topic, essentially, is cutting hooks. Um, what do you guys use as a determining factor of when you absolutely need to cut hooks versus, hey, I think I can get this out with my tools? What are your guys' thoughts on this? I'd say 90% of the time we can get the hooks out of a fish. I'd hate to leave hooks in a fish, but if they're down in the gills where I can't really get them without doing any damage, we're cutting them, plain and simple. I maybe cut hooks a little more often, but a lot of times what I'll do is if that fish twisted in the bag and then another hook on the lure is what's caught you know, in the net and is tangling them up, I'll cut those hooks. I'll cut the ones that are tangled up in the net, free that fish, and by that time they usually do a head shake and the uh, you know, the, the hooks come out of their mouth, but when in doubt, if you think it's going to be difficult and if it's in the best interest of that fish, yeah, cut them hooks that are in them, but remember that, you know, where is that other piece of the hook? Grab your long needle nose, get that out of there, because number one, it's not good for the fish. Number two, you go reach in for a picture, and there's half a five-hour hook from a bulldog sitting in the fish. Now it's going in your hand. So, you know, again, like I said, I love cutting the ones that are tangled on the net, and that frees the fish. Next thing you know, the hooks in the fish's mouth are out, so... Uh, same deal. I cut hooks probably, maybe shockingly little, at least hooks that are inside of a fish. I also try not to leave one in there unless you absolutely have to. One thing I would add on that is going in as a point of entry instead of going in through the mouth, even with the long nose players, going in from under the gill plate. That is something I use for walleyes, it's something I use for bass, it's something I use for muskies a ton. I, I almost never use a jaw spreader. What I'll do actually, there's, they have rows, the way that the rows of teeth, if you ever look inside a muskie's mouth, there's the whole top of the roof of the mouth is a big row of teeth, but there's soft spots on either side. I go up in with my hand, and I'm, I got long fingers, I got big hands, I can push up, and I can usually get that fish to kind of, you know, open up a little bit like that, and you can go in from under, in, you know, minding that you don't hit the red gill membrane, you're not damaging that in any way, but you can go in from behind when you're holding that fish, holding it like this, and going in, you know, opening and looking to see where you gotta go, and then, <laughs> or going in from underneath and looking in through the mouth, and then, you know, popping that hook to, to kind of reverse it out that way is a much better way to go in than using an exceedingly long needle nose and trying to you know, fish it out of there from, from the top down. Great teamwork, guys. That was a good plan. We had that plan. Uh, yeah, I was going to go kind of what uh, along the lines that Kevin was going along. Um, we don't have any research out there that, that lets us know the effects of leaving that hook necessarily in a fish's mouth. We do have um, research that shows what happens when you leave those hooks in their gullet or in their stomach. Those who, hooks do not rust out. They're a huge uh, area where you can breed infection. And so if you leave those hook fragments in the fish's mouth, it's just asking for trouble as far as the environment that you live in. The, the freshwater systems are ripe with bacteria, so there's a lot of opportunity for those hooks that are left in a fish to cause um, significant bacterial damage and disease and potentially mortality. Um, so if you do have to cut them, get them out of the fish before you let it go. Because I have a feeling that if we did the research that we'd find an alarmingly high rate of serious infection in the fish that we left hooks into. I have one last quick thing to add to that, kind of on both of these guys touched on it, but I really want to reiterate the point. One, from a personal safety standpoint, but two, from a fish safety standpoint, when you are cutting a hook, especially one that's deep inside of a fish, like a lot of times, again, the ones I cut, I'll have to go in through the gill plate like that. You're kind of looking over. Obviously, you're usually wearing sunglasses when, you're, when you are fishing, but when you go to cut that hook, it can come flying out at you. Second point to that being, make sure that you have kind of a game plan or try to cut it at an angle, like if you practice cutting hooks and done it a little bit, that you're not letting that big barb go back down then into the fish's gullet. I have that happen like the first time, I mean, many years ago, cut the hooks on it, all of a sudden, you know, here goes the hook barb, it goes off, and it's like, boop, right in the gullet, and down it goes, I'm like, ooh, that can't be good. You know, that's not, I mean, it happened just like that, you know, and it was gone before I could do anything, but it's something to keep in mind. I'll maybe turn the fish a little sideways so that when that, he said the hook is going to fly somewhere, but when it does, that doesn't just go whoop, and right down the hatch, right? So it lands in their mouth, or you try to you know, kind of get it so it comes home. But be very cognizant of where that cut piece is going to fly, is my point. Excellent. Everybody familiar with these on the dais? Anybody use those? 
Um, rarely, but they do have an application, certainly, especially for, for larger fish and trolling applications, I would leave that to these guys. I personally don't use them very much, but when you do use them, or really at all, but when you do use them, don't use them necessarily for a fish hold. Use them as a tool to get something, you know, to, to pry open a side boat or get a better, uh, uh, a better, better leverage on a fish rather than holding it up like this for a picture. That's not good use. No pictures with photos. No, so, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, again, what Jeff said, it's a control tool and the fish is in a net. Uh, where I really like to utilize this and talk to any ER doctor in northern Wisconsin. Most guys get hooked from 36 inch or smaller pike and muskie. So when you do have that little snot nose pike on that's got two hooks buried in it, this is an awesome tool to control that fish so you don't end up with you know, a set of hooks in your hand. Uh, but again, you, know, you can direct that fish, you can keep its head underwater, you can keep it in one spot and get those hooks out. It's a control and a net tool. Or you know, if somebody in the boat is ticking you off, it's also a billy club. But yeah, it's not for lifting fish up out of the water, it's not for pictures. Uh, it's a tool to control the fish in the net. I do own one of these. The only thing we've ever used it for is little kids when they're holding crappies or bluegills or like you said, a small snake northern. Um, we never use it on muskies. And I'll jump right into the, the photo part of this. Um, never ever do we use these for when it comes to holding muskies. Two things. One, if it's an experienced muskie angler and he's caught fish before and he knows how to hold them, I'll let them take them out of the net. If the camera's ready, click a picture and that fish is released. If it's an inexperienced angler, and I've had this happen before, I will get the camera ready, I'll get them ready, I'll get them with a glove on, and I will grab the muskie out of the net, and I'll show them how you have to handle that muskie between the gill plate and the gills, so they don't get their fingers up in the gills. Two things, one, you're gonna kill the muskie, or could kill it, two, muskie's gills are like, I, I like to refer to them as uh, Chinese finger cuffs with razor blades on them. You get your fingers in there, they're not coming out unless they're cut to pieces. Actually, to add one quick thing to that, uh, with you know, boat and netting and pulling bigger fish out of high-sided boats that we run on the Great Lakes, uh, what I typically do for people is, get, you know, the fish is in the net, chilling out, board is wet, it's sitting on the side, I talk to the client, here's what we're gonna do, I'll lift it out of the net, because they are a little heavier and harder to handle sometimes, I'll get it on the board, we get that quick measurement, you slide right up in front of me, you slide your gloved hand right under my hand, get the firm grip, and then you'll roll it towards you. So basically, they're, they're grabbing the hold from you from three, four seconds when it's on that board. It's just a lot easier for them to control the fish that way than for them to try and you see it. It happens, you lift these big fish out of the net, it flops, it's bounced around on the floor of the net. So that's what I like to do with inexperienced people is bring it in, get it on the board, they slide right in front of you, they put their hand where yours is, you pull yours out, you help them lift and roll that fish, turn them, get the pictures, gone. If you think it's hard to hold a muskie after you've battled it with 100 pound test and put it in a net for a while, try grabbing one out of a flight net one time. Because when they come out of a flight net, they're what's called green. And I've handled thousands of fish doing that. Um, I am a huge proponent in gloves. Um, Phil, you're right. If, if your hand's bleeding after you catch a muskie, that's because you're stupid, not because you're tough. And that's my personal opinion. Um, and you can yell at me if you want. but. I always wear a glove, it saves my hands all the time. And when you hold on to that fish properly, like Phil described, that they don't get away. You just need to use firm pressure and hold those things. It's really important to hold those fish tight with a gloved hand. It's the best for you and the fish. I would, I would add one quick thing to that. When it comes to gloves, I actually, I, I never wear them, I'll be honest. It's not because I don't believe in them, I think that's a great, it's a great thing that people should do. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan is completely wrong, never wear gloves. <laughs> no, but, but what I'm getting at there is, if you are properly handling a muskie, it, really you probably won't have any cuts or maybe a little rake or rash or something because it went right. Why you're wearing that glove is for when it goes wrong, okay? And when you are handling those fish, again, where he said the firm pressure of that, there's a, certainly to the point you have to tame them down a little bit when you go take them out of the net. It's very rare in my boat that I let anybody take that muskie out of the net outside myself. All right, Kevin, for maybe a different reason, you know, big water, big fish, high-sided boats, but for me, it's just, it's a safety thing too. High-sided boat, you've got maybe experienced, maybe inexperienced. You want, there's a, there's a very brief time when you first take them out of the net when they are gonna be very, very resistant, and then they're gonna succumb most times, and you got about a 30 second window, all right? And that's when you pull them out, and you go, okay, either he, hang it, hop in next to me on the tail side of the fish, hop, 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 okay, fish goes back in. Or you take them out, and since you're holding or something, maybe if it's a really inexperienced person, we'll pop a quick picture, 
and then I'll just pass them to them all within the same. Somebody else is standing with the camera. We're not adding any extra handling time. It's just a very quick trade-off. And before I do this, I will show them where I like to use the illustration like the soft part of your underjaw. Underneath them, there's a soft area inside of the muskie's mouth right in here, same as you have right here inside your jawbone. And the muskies are looking to go in and curve around to hold right there with, all, with downward pressure from the outside. Very similar, like, like so. And, and so that's where you really want to hold. You don't want to go in really far. And back to where I, the original point of this is with gloves, I see people that get very, very, very bold when they hold a muskie. And I see in the pictures where their gill rakers are all off to the side because the knuckles are way up in there. Just because you have a glove on and you're not going to get cut up doesn't mean you can manhandle that fish. You're doing extreme damage to that fish's you know, essentially their lungs and respiratory organs when you do that kind of, kind of deal. Um, let's talk about handling the fish now. We've talked about the, you know, the nets and the uh, getting the hooks out. What about the actual hero shot? What are you guys' thoughts? I've got a, a, I've got a slide up behind you right now that shows some of the different types of holes. This has been seen numerous places throughout the interwebs. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on Oh, your this? best photo doesn't look so good. <laughs> that, that doesn't look good. Um, you know, like I kind of said before, as far as handling fish, I personally take them out of the net if the guy's never held a fish before, and you support the belly with one hand, and you hold the other hand underneath the gills in a soft spot, yep. like Jeff said. That's that thumb that, up in that notch, that triangle notch. Now, yeah, you don't want your heard. thumb going over the top. I can give you, you've got time exactly. for a quick story. I can tell you something that happened to some clients of mine. Absolutely. Okay, so I had these two guys from New Hampshire fishing with me. They'd fished earlier in the year, and they hooked into a muskie while walleye fishing, snapped the line, the guy says, what was that? I said, well, that was a muskie. He says, I want to fish for them. I said, well, season's closed. When does it open? I said, well, it'll be open in June. They're IT guys from Liberty Mutual Insurance, so they said, we'll be back. Sure enough, they came back in June, and they wanted a muskie fish. So we went out, got in the water. I gave one a top water, I gave one a spinner bait. We were working a wee bed. And uh, a muskie came up on the top water and followed it right to the boat. And uh, it took a swipe at the bait and missed it. And uh, the one gentleman says, I saw him, I saw him, he was right there. He's pretty excited about it. And uh, he says, that's, that's good enough for me. He said, I, uh, I'm excited just from seeing a muskie. Well, I said, well, let's make a loop around the weed bed. We'll see if we can get him hit again. So we made a complete loop around the weed bed. We came back to the exact spot, gave that, time, gave that fish time to get back to where he was located. And we... And they cast it in there, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm like, oh, let's move on. And the one gentleman says, we need one more cast. He throws a spinner bait in there, and all of a sudden, the fish just blew up on it. And he got him. We got it to the boat, got it to the net. And an experienced muskie anglers, and I said, OK. I said, I'll get the fish out of the net. I'm going to have you hold it. I'm going to get the camera ready. And I said, let's get you to wear a glove. I don't need a glove. Big, tough guy. I said, you really want to wear a glove? I said, they got really sharp teeth, and they got bad razor blades in their gills. I don't want to wear a glove. I said, okay, fine. Well, to take the picture, I said, I'll get the fish out and I'll hand it to you. And when I, when I went to hand it to him, I showed him teeth. I said, you don't want your hands in there. And I said, and the gills are like Chinese finger cuffs with razor blades. I said, so you got to be really careful. They don't slide up in there. I said, I want you to grab it just like I have it. Firm grip, quick picture, and we're going to let it go. Okay. Well, his buddy wants to be in a picture with him. So he gets up and he stands next to him like this. Sure. So I go to hand him the fish, and as I hand him the fish, I turn to grab the camera, he's holding the fish, I click the photo and the fish starts kicking, and his thumb goes, it wasn't underneath, it went in the mouth, and it cut him, the whole width of his thumb, and the blood was starting to go down his arm, and he's screaming, it's got me, it's got me, and he's hanging on, and he's hanging on, his other fingers are going up into the gills, and he's in bad shape, and he's screaming, get it off, get it off, it's got me, and I went to, went to grab it, and as I went to grab the fish, it let loose, and in slow motion, floated through the air, mouth open, and latched onto the other guy right in the side. <laughs> now it's got him in the side, and it's smashing, hanging there, and he's got a vinyl jacket on, so the teeth are buried in the mesh, and it's like an alligator just flinging around like this, and this guy is looking at his buddy with blood rolling down his arm, screaming, oh my god, it's got me now, and I'm trying to pull this fish off of him, and I can't get a grip on him, because he's slippery, so I'm trying to pull the fish off, and this guy is just freaking out, I finally grabbed it by the gills, and I got a good hold of it, and I pulled his mouth open, and I, well, cover his ears, I threw him in the net, <laughs> and the guy's going, 
what the hell, he's pulling up his jacket, it's all bloody on the side. What the hell kind of fish is that? I said, that's a muskie. <laughs> Excellent story. Uh, uh, my biggest thing with pictures on fish, uh, bump boards in the back of the boat along the side. So basically when you're grabbing a fish off the bump board in my boat, your right knee is on the back casting deck, your left foot is just off the casting deck on the floor. And I always say it's the wedding proposal, one knee down, the other one bent. They literally can take that fish, turn, and you know that fish is only a foot and a half off the bottom of my boat because their knee is on the, the casting deck, their other foot is down on the floor. So if they do lose control, it's a short distance. I hate having people holding big fish up, standing straight up. So I, the catcher position, if you're in a baseball or the wedding proposal, one knee down, one up, you're a foot and a half off the floor. If something goes wrong, it's a quick to the floor. And it's just easier to control that fish Absolutely. when you're here versus up there. So that's, I like that. I like that. And that way too, when you're shooting a picture down, then it takes away a lot of the background. Yeah. So I just want to do something real quick. When you hold that fish, the proper hold is not to have your thumb out. When you're holding it correctly, your thumb is in like this. It's not quite, it's more like this. You'll be holding the gill between your thumb and the rest of your hand. That's what you'll have a hold of. You start doing this, what happened with Phil's client is going to happen to you. I got four stitch scar right here from the same thing. All right, we are very pressed for time. I just want to move on quickly, Jordan, if you could just answer the question about fizzy logic. We've seen a lot of videos and heard a lot of uh, stories about folks using soda, Pepsi, what have you, Dr. Pepper, to cauterize bleeding gills in fish. What are your thoughts on this from a biological standpoint? Okay, so let's just try to do common sense as well. So soda is really acidic. It's like three on the pH scale. That's very acidic substance. And so yeah, it might stop the bleeding, but there's a really high probability it's gonna damage those sensitive gill filaments. It, it would be almost like aspirating some soda into your lungs, lungs that probably wouldn't make you feel very good. So that's really what it comes down to. Um, however, there is some research being done in Canada right now on this very subject. So if, if I'm wrong, I'll be the first one to admit that I'm wrong, but common sense and the chemistry behind that soda bath on the breathing apparatus of a muskie tells me you shouldn't do it. So we were joking about this, we were texting back and forth the other day, and I made the comment on, yeah, I realize it does cauterize that, but, you know, in 25 years of being a firefighter, I spent a lot of it in the ambulance, we don't carry cans of Coke or Pepsi to dump in people when they get a wound into their lungs. It's not good. You know, think of that. They basically, that fish is, you know, it's their, their, their bronchial, their alveoli is exposed. And if you're dumping soda on the area that's torn and it's cauterizing it, it's doing the cauterization to the rest of it. So you're basically cauterizing that entire area. Excellent point. So um, we did touch upon, again, we are pressed for time. We touched a little bit about some current items. Were there any other items that we wanted to cover from a high level current? And then we'll talk with Big Water, Inland Lakes, and then we'll kind of wrap this up and we'll get some questions from the audience. So Phil, you want to start with current? I guess as far as current goes, you know, we talked a little bit about musky release and the current as far as, you know, keeping that fish pointed into the direction of the, of the current. Um, one of the things I really wanted to touch on as far as current doesn't really, um, it's not towards some, geared towards the muskies, it's more geared towards you. Um, a lot of people don't think about this, but when you look at a river system, you automatically assume that the water's heading one direction, downriver, and it's completely wrong. Where current seems meet, where there's an underwater island, especially below any dam, there's always an island, and that misdirects the current. And a lot of times, you don't see it, but the current's headed right back at the dam. And I've been involved in rescue missions where we've had to pull people out of the water. I've actually pulled, I pulled a boat and two young men out of the water that one pushed their boat out into the river and the motor would start, and they were on the wrong side of the river where the current was actually creating a big eddy, and they got sucked into the dam. Good thing I was down river and I ran up there with my boat beached it, ran up there with an anchor rope. I was able to get it to them and pull them safely to shore and with, the, with the help of another gentleman that was fishing on along the bank. Um, the thing I tell people to look for is debris on the surface. That can always tell you the direction of the current. If you see it just floating in a small area, that's your eddy. There's no current there. If you see it going the opposite direction past you in the river, it's not the wind. That's your 
this directed current going back up river. It may have hit an underwater obstacle like an island or a wing dam or something, and that current's going the wrong way. Now, I want you to think about something very seriously. Let's just say that water's going five miles an hour. Doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Well, that's 100 feet in 60 seconds. Now, you stop to tie a hook or take a fish off, 60 seconds, you're slammed into that dam if you're not paying attention, and you might be in really bad shape. So you really gotta think about current when you fish a river. Because it can be your worst enemy, but it can also be your best friend. Excellent points. I want to just kind of jump real quickly. I, we may not be able to hit big water and inland lakes right now, but I do want Jordan, just to, or even Jeff, to talk a little bit about high water temps during the dog days of summer, uh, O2 levels, how that affects fishing. We've got about three minutes, and I want to make sure that we get some audience participation. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote an article in Muskie Hunter about this too. It was uh, April, May 2017 issue. Uh, there's, there's not a definitive answer to this. I know we've had a lot of anglers, and Jeff's had some experiences with, with um, you know, some fish that look pretty rough or maybe didn't let, uh, survive after some high water temperatures. It's use the best information and your best judgment in this situation. Um, there aren't a lot of definitive arguments scientifically one way or the other. Um, we're also doing some research in uh, West Virginia on this particular subject right now, so you'll be hearing more about it. But you know, there's there's water dissolved oxygen issues, but typically we have plenty of dissolved oxygen in the water in Wisconsin when it gets hot. Um, it's really used your best judgment. If you think that something bad can happen, perhaps do something else. I did want to just elaborate a little bit on what he was mentioning there. We were at a different seminar here. We actually um, like a week or two ago, and we were having this discussion also. Um, but as it relates to water temperature, one of the things where I feel like it really, really negatively impacts fish, at least in our northern Wisconsin areas, is people that are out there doing thermocline trolling in the heat of summer. That is a time when you should probably leave those fish alone. I'm not saying it's not effective, I'm not saying it doesn't work, but when you're out there on a super hot August day or late July day, and you're trolling down 20, 22, 25 feet along the thermocline, and you've got high water temperatures, that muskie is going to suffer when it comes up. Okay, It's going to be extremely difficult to handle those fish effectively and get them back down through that warm water, especially if it's peak in the middle of the day. That is where I mentioned, I said, I just don't like the way they swim away when it happens. I'm not saying you can't do it, you know, to each their own, but it's one of those things to be avoided. Um, in terms of up by us, our hot waters, you know, you start getting down towards Madison, even here on south, you know, from this area south, you do get a lot warmer water temperatures than we get, you know, north of Highway 8, you know, up in that neck of the woods or even up north of Highway 70. Usually our nights are cool enough. Um, on those really, really hot days, just avoid the, the shallower stained waters. That's usually where your better beds. Go somewhere deeper. If I'm casting on Trout Lake or something like that, or Lake Tomahawk, something big, deep and clear, it can be 95 degrees out all week. And a lot of times it's still only going down just a little bit in that water column because there's so much water there to warm. Now you go and take that over to say the Pike Round Chain, something shallow, the color of coffee, and, and now you've got that water, that, that temperature can penetrate down very almost to the, the point to the bottom. It can go a lot further down that water profile. And those fish are, you know, being affected by that vastly more than they would be on a larger body of water. Okay, thank you. We do have one minute. One more point. Um, and I understand what Jeff's saying, but again, let's go back to stress on these fish. If they're going to bite your bait, they're not stressed by the temperature. But what he, to his point, what he's talking about is after. So they're not stressed when they're eating. They may be stressed by what happens afterwards if you're not fishing at getting the fish hooked, un unhooked and released. So there are uh, multiple aspects and there isn't a definitive scientific proof at this point. I just want to touch on one thing really quick. We're going to talk about social media. <laughs> Bring up etiquette as musky anglers because we're seeing on social media all the time like we were musky fishing on this lake and a bass fisherman next to us caught a fish or accidentally caught a musky and he wasn't handling it right so we went over by him and f-bombed this and called him this and told him that and went back to the landing and you know took a leak in his gas tank because he mishandled that musky cut that crap out when you see somebody that's not musky fishing that has one that's struggling be the good guy be the ambassador for musky fishing wave give him a holler hey i've got a net i've got the tools let me help let me jump in your boat you know, you get in their boat, you get the fish in your net, you show them how to unhook it, you school them the whole time, you explain things as nicely as you can, you get your bump board out, hey, we're gonna get some great pictures, here you go, we'll show you how to hold the fish. Get a picture with them with the fish, give them Rick Lax's phone number, release the fish, be the ambassador, because if somebody's screaming at me because I made a mistake and I didn't know, you know what I'm gonna do next time? I'm gonna do it even worse. So instead, yeah, seriously, 
So let's, let, this, is my, this is how I end my seminars. Let's be the ambassadors. When you see that happen, be the good guy. Go over there, help them, be their best friend. And now they might just like musky fishermen and they might do it more often, but now you've educated them in the proper way versus screaming and hollering because again, next time they accidentally hook one, they were gonna remember Jeff and I screaming and hollering at them and slashing their tires at the boat landing. So let's not do that. It does happen. Let's, let's be the ambassadors. Let's make musky fishing look like we're a bunch of nice people, which we should be, we are. And that's, that's, that, that's my podium speech, I'm done. Awesome, don't be a knob shot, basically. So TNG when you're out there, I know my KMTT partner and I, whenever he comes up by me, I told him the first year, we are TNG, team nice guy out of the water. People want to cut us off, hey, you guys want in or out, we can slide out. We know there's fish all over the place, not necessarily in that spot. So we do whatever we can to accommodate our, our fellow anglers and uh, not jump down their throats at every chance we get. So just want to say that. Unfortunately, you can't get into the Q&A right now. Will we be able to get one? I'm sorry, we can't. We ran a little bit over, unfortunately. But I do want to thank our panelists one more time. Please give them a great, great round of applause. Lots of great information. Also lots of information that I did I wasn't aware of. So this is an excellent opportunity to take this and apply it to your daily, uh, daily activities on the water. And we're wishing every one of you a great, safe 2020 out of the water. Thank Actually, you. if anybody has specific questions, you can find Jeff in the Lax booth. Next man, Munjin. I'm wandering around the show. Yep. I'll either be by Lake X or TNA booth. Okay. And one other item, we talk a lot about netting, things like that, releases. I encourage everybody to stop by the Title Town Release Them Right booth. It's way at the far end of the entrance hallway. We've got video running, 40 minutes, with dozens and dozens of capture and release safe stuff that you can take a look at that we really encourage you guys to come down and take a look at it. So thank you guys again. Appreciate it. And also, if you want to get some, some release tools, Ross's, Sports Shop, I highly recommend you go directly to them. Thank you.